Good afternoon. I am pleased to welcome you to our first virtual lecture of the Dean's Diversity Series of Fall 2020 here at Vanderbilt University School of Nursing. My name is Julia Steed. In 2020, the year of the nurse, nurses continue to rank as the most trusted, ethical, and honest profession. Nurses have received this rating for the past 18 years in a row because we own the responsibility to care for our patients holistically and advocate for the most vulnerable of patient populations. Our speaker today, Professor Alice Randall, was invited to remind us of this res responsibility and commitment and share with us ways to use our voices for justice. Our objective with our time today is to explore a novel approach to experience diverse cultures and how to influence the way we interact with others. Before we get started, there are two housekeeping items that I would like to mention. Number one, the chat is open for dialogue throughout the lecture for you to respond to what is being discussed and share thoughts among one another. Number two, there will be a question and answer session at the conclusion of Professor Randall's lecture. Um, in order to keep the discussion lively, I encourage you to ask questions during the lecture by posting them anonymously in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your control panel. Now, Dean Norman will introduce our speaker for today. Good afternoon. To any new students and <clears throat> Alice Randall fans who don't know me, I'm Linda Norman and I'm the Dean of the School of Nursing. And I'd like to welcome you to this year's first VUSN Dean's Diversity Lecture Series. We launched this series several years ago to explore different aspects of diversity, inclusion and equity, and to provide our students with knowledge that they can use in caring for their patients many of whom are part of underrepresented populations. Today's speaker has the gift of bridging and celebrating populations and cultures and sharing them with the world. Alice Randall is a New York Times best-selling novelist, award-winning songwriter, educator, and food activist. That's why I love you so much. We have so much in common, Alice. <laughs> Ew. Uh, I, and as many of you know her as the professor and writer in residence at the Department of African American Studies here at Vanderbilt. In addition to being a successful novelist, Alice has published a children's book, a cookbook, nonfiction books, and many articles. She is an award-winning songwriter who wrote Trisha Yearwood's second number one hit, I didn't know this about you, of X's and O's, An American Girl. Alex, Alice is a dynamic speaker with the writer skill of looking at familiar things with fresh eyes. Today, she'll share with us ways to develop an anti-racist toolkit using a very novel approach. And I, I have so enjoyed hearing Alice in the past and look forward to your contribution to us today. Thank you so much. And please join me in welcoming Alice. Thank you, Dean Norman. Greetings. I am thrilled to be with you all today. We are gathered in this hour virtually to celebrate, to honor alliances between the arts and medicine in general, and to initiate and celebrate alliances between nursing and novels in particular. I'd like to thank Dean Norman for hosting the Dean's Diversity Lecture at the Vanderbilt School of Nursing and honoring me with an invitation to address you, the dynamic and honorable frontline workers who comprise the larger community of Vanderbilt School of Nursing. And I thank Julia Steed and Sarah Putnam for making this literal event virtually happen. Rolanda Johnson, I thank you for being present and wise. And I thank all of you gathered. I see 233 strong in this virtual Zoom together. I thank you as a person who has been cared for and coached to health 
throughout my life cycle by Vanderbilt nurses. I birthed a daughter at Vanderbilt 33 years ago at the end of a high risk pregnancy with multiple hospitalizations along the way. An amazing nursing. I had a double mastectomy at Vanderbilt just about two years ago. And in between there were wisdom teeth pulled out and so many well patient, patient visits with nurse practitioners. So I thank you as an individual patient novelist. But I also want to thank you, each and all, on behalf of the Tennessee community, on behalf of a national community, on behalf of a global community comprised specifically of people who, like me, have been cared for by a nurse at Vanderbilt, cared for by a nurse trained at Vanderbilt, somewhere far distant, or cared for by a nurse trained by a nurse who trained at Vanderbilt. Your impact is global. And this impact is as visible as the nurse who studied in his, her, or their home country, came to Vanderbilt as a graduate nursing student, earned an advanced degree and returned to their home country, and it is as invisible as a nurse working for the US Department of Veterans Affairs and there are so many of you, helping a veteran and their family in the aftermath of war navigate an amputation, navigate a post-traumatic stress disorder, honoring the service of the veteran and inspiring the son or daughter of the veteran to follow their parent into military service because of the culturally competent way you did your job. It is as invisible and significant as a student I was speaking to at 1 a.m. It was actually 1.09 a.m. in the morning, two nights ago. A student locked down in COVID quarantine, a student from multiple minority population, and unsure as how to get their textbooks and nervous about their fall of senior progress that was essential to graduation. I was present to take that call because a nurse practitioner many years back found the words to point me onto a weight loss journey that was life-saving. Through basic research, research focused on long-term management of acute and chronic illness, on the understanding, treating, and preventing of mental illness, on the discovering and utilizing of cutting edge approaches, on data analysis and study design, on the uses of technology to create better, better patient outcomes, on palliative care science, and on pregnancy outcomes and mother and infant health, all of which have been or are signature areas of enterprise and excellence for the Vanderbilt School of Nursing. The Vanderbilt School of Nursing makes national and global impact. And we are here today to deepen our commitment to making these signature areas of research be areas of enterprise, excellence, and equity. I'm here with you this noon, a black woman and a novelist and sometimes patient to share with you specific and quick, useful actions and multiple reading lists that allow you to take a novel approach to building your own anti-racist toolkit and will equip you to help colleagues, family members, and patients who need or want to engage in anti-racist work for the first time or in new and advanced ways to do so by building anti-racist reading kits of their own. And I will start at this moment and say, it's a little like the mask. Sometimes the folks who need them most are the folks who don't think that they need them. We all need to wear a COVID mask when we're out in public and we all need to build anti-racist toolkits in case we need them. On our way to that, I wanna stop and say a few words about novels and nurses writ large. My very favorite famous novelists who were nurses, Agatha Christie, Nella Larson, who I'll come back to, Susan Monk Kidd and Elizabeth Berg. My very favorite fictional nurses in novels, Claire Randall in Outlander, Captain Barkley and Miss Gage in A Farewell to Arms, Myra Lipinski in Never Change, and Hannah in The English Patient by Michael Ondaatje. And to get straight to the point, I want to offer you 10 novels. Actually, I had to 
expanded to 12, that make a fine foundation for an anti-racist toolkit. And I want you to know that when I was preparing this anti-racist toolkit, this reading list, I considered your responses to your materials when you were registering for this. And I found that your favorite uh, genre was literary fiction uh, and followed by biographies, murder mysteries, thrillers, and romance novels. And so here's the list inspired by you. First on the list, Quicksand by Nella Larson. This is for all of you who love literary faction and biographies. Quick, Nella Larson is one of the most important African-American novelists of all times. Her two most famous books are Passing and Quicksand. She's a brilliant woman. Her works appear on almost all top 100 lists of American fiction. How many of you knew Nella Larson? was a trained nurse. She started her training here at Fisk University. She will rise to being head nurse at Tuskegee. And she will nurse in New York City for almost 30 years. She will die in the nursing profession. She will nurse before and after writing novels. And her first book, Quicksand, is a, telling, is a novelistic telling of her life story that I think will intrigue you who share her life's profession. Quicksand by Nella Larson. Number two on my list is Their Eyes Are Watching God by Zero Neil Hurston, my favorite book of all times. It involves medicine, rabies, it involves romance, it in involves what it takes to become whole, to feel whole, and what interferes with that. Number three, for those of you on the list who loved mysteries, I've got Blanche on the Lamb and Blanche Among the Talented Tenth by Barbara Neely. Barbara Neely is the first African-American woman re recognized as a murder mystery writer. Her Blanche is a domestic servant who both serves in Blanche on the Lamb among privileged white people in the South, and in Blanche Among the Talented Tenth, she is working with privileged Black people in an East Coast uh, resort and she's got trouble in both places and it will inform you and intrigue you to read her. Number four, I've got Kindred by Octavia Butler, perhaps the greatest science fiction writer ever risen in America and a black woman. You can't learn more about race in any other text than you can in Kindred. Number five, I've got Lyndon Hills by Gloria Naylor. For those of you who like classic fiction, it's a black retelling of Dante's Inferno in an upper middle class community. At the other end of the spectrum, Coldest Winter Ever by Sister Soldier. That's for you thriller lovers out there. And it's also for every one of you who's ever had to tend a drug dealer, a drug dealer's child, a drug dealer's spouse. And it's gonna give you some new insights to what the folks in that world are up against. At seven and eight, I've got two hard to read books that are well worth reading. The Salt Eaters by Tony K. Bambara is all about healing, but a healing in a very different space than where you heal. It's about healing, tolerance for ambiguity, complexity. You're gonna ask yourself a dozen times when you're reading this book, what is actually happen happening? And most of the action in the whole book takes place in 20 minutes, and you are gonna be confused and you're gonna to learn to tolerate being confused. And that is going to make you a better person. Number eight, I've got The Book of Night Williams by Women, The Book of Night William, Women by Marlon James. This is about the complexity of survival strategies and motivation. It is the most violent book you will ever read about enslavement, slavery, and rape. And you will get out of this book as much as it takes out of you to read it. The other end of the spectrum, unusually easy to read but significant, I'm gonna give you two children's books, young adult books. Sometimes you don't need to read an adult book. Y'all work so hard all day, but you need some deep fiction. Go to Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry by Mildred Taylor. You'll never understand the plight of the black mother or the black student more or monster, which is about a trial, Walter Dean Myers. And you better hope you are nothing like monster's lawyer. Though she gets him off, I will tell you, when you are quote unquote monster's nurse. 
At 11, I'm putting in Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. I actually wrote my thesis on Jane Austen when I was an undergraduate at Harvard. And I use that to lead into my bigger discussion about fiction. The fiction does not have to be about black lives or about diverse lives to make you better at treating a better nurse for diverse populations. It is fiction, we'll get into that alone, that will help most. And at 12, I'm going to put Signs Preceding the End of the World by Yura Herrera, which is what you should read instead of American Dirt, which underlines that actually, we do get a benefit by reading fiction about cultures that are different than our own and immersing in that world. But when we do that, look to read, not something written by the person in that world necessarily, because sometimes great books are written by someone not from that population. Read things that are actually being read by people from the population that is being discussed. Find out what they are reading about themselves, what they think speaks to their own spirit. In this case, signs preceding the end of the world. In my case, there was a little children's book called Amazing Grace. I love reading to my daughter. That is written by a white English woman. It's still one of the best books in black children's literature. There are amazing books, which I just told you, Walter Dean Myers and Mildred Taylor, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. There are extraordinary numbers of great books for black children written by black people. But you'll find Amazing Grace on a lot of black children bookshelves. And that's what I want you to look for, whether it's about um, whatever population you're thinking about, read the books that that population is telling you or tells you, tells their story. Many people eager to build up their anti-racist toolkit and the good ally muscle and the good, their good ally muscles are rushing off to read books. What, white Fragility is a popular choice, and it is an important book. Nonfiction is important, no argument there. But it may not be as important or useful as it intuitively appears. And there is actually research around this, so I speak to you as a novelist. Research suggests that confirmation bias, the tendency to read to assemble the facts that confirm what we already believe, come strongly into play when we read nonfiction, being that a newspaper article or a historical text. Evidence suggests confirmation bias disengages when we read fiction. Reading nonfiction often makes our biases more rigid. It makes many of us less capable of changing our mind, of reversing course. Reading fiction is completely different. Let's take an extreme example, jump right in. Most of us, I would hesitate to suggest all of us on this call would agree it is absolutely wrong to murder people for money. And I think we would all agree it would be wrong to put someone on a payroll and keep someone on a payroll whose sole job is to murder our enemies. Consider this hypothetical. You know someone in a position to give a friend of yours a small job that that person could do well but the person doesn't want to give your friend the job. Your friend has other job offers. This is not life or death, but your friend wants that job. What if I tell you that the plan to get your friend the job is to have a healthy racehorse beheaded and place the bloody head in the bed of the person who can give your friend the job. So the terrified person will give the small job to your friend and your friend will be happy. How many of you would want to spend hours with a person who would do that? Who would employ contract killers to behead horses? How many of you would be sad when the person who slits horse and human heads without blinking dies? Well, there are 235 of you on this call right now. And I bet most of you are saying, I would not want to spend any time with that person. But I'm gonna tell you, there are a lot of people on this call right now who spent a lot of quality time with that person. And that there are sane people, many on this Zoom, who care deeply for the character just like that. Don Corleone from The Godfather. Luca Brasi from The Godfather. Fiction puts us so completely in another person's shoes, 
we almost don't notice when he's ordering horses to heads to be beheaded and his best friend is a contract killer. Reading fiction, we are led to comprehend what is incomprehensible from our personal worldview. That powerful capacity can be put to good use when we understand how it works. Reading fiction develops empathy, emotional intelligence, and insight. It develops our ability to construct an understanding of another person's theory of mind. In that case, Don Corleone. Once we understand it better, we can deconstruct it. We are actually not limited to approving of his theory of mind, but we may be more capable of changing his theory of mind, and we may be more capable of creating interventions because we understand how he's thinking. Reading fiction sharpens our ability to comprehend other people's motivations. It gets us beyond binary divisions of good and evil. It moves readers past aversion to ambiguity. And perhaps most important in both this healthcare setting and this election cycle, it moves us past a desire for premature cognitive closure. We must be wary of premature cognitive closure. Reading fiction helps us develop a mature willingness to embrace cognitive ambiguity and to develop an open mind and the sometimes life-saving capacity to change our mind. Desire for cognitive closure can mislead us to coming to a conclusion before all the facts are in and send even those of us who want to be progressive lurching towards stereotypes that explain some of what we are seeing. Desire to cop for cognitive closure can lead us to premature closure all too often. Reading fiction encourages curiosity and flexibility. It embeds us in worlds that have been previously unknown to us, whether that is Jane Austen's 18th century, Puzo's Mafia Land, or Zora Neale Hurston's Florida Muck, and makes us care about those worlds. And by disengaging us from what we think we know, we come back to that world with fresh eyes. Fiction can turn disdain to respect. It can turn fear into appreciation. It teaches us to ask new and sometimes better questions. Fiction leads us to appreciate the pleasure of being surprised. And sometimes in medical settings, surprise leads to fear. Fiction leads us to appreciate the pleasure of surprise that is intrinsic in the scientific process and investigation, allowing us to ask new and better questions, allowing us to have increased respect for difference, all essential tools in the anti-racist toolkit. And yet, many of you are actually too busy to read a novel. Fortunately, novels are not the only fiction. There are short stories and there is flash fiction. If I had to suggest only one piece of fiction for you to read for your anti-racist toolkit, it would be the short story, Boys Go to Ju Jupiter by Danielle Evans. I have given a lot of thought as to all the potential things I could put forward to you as the single one best short story. And it is Boys Go to Jupiter by Daniel Evans. I happened to spend some time with her once at Yado, a writing retreat in upstate New York filled with bats. But uh, that's not the reason. The reason is it's a brilliant story about two young women at a college campus not unlike Vanderbilt, one of whom finds herself in a Confederate flag bathing suit. It includes two mothers who have breast cancer, one of whom dies and one of whom lives. And at the end of the story, someone else completely is dead. Whether you need an introduction to racism in America or an advanced course, this short story will teach you much and you will enjoy being taught. That is the genius of putting fiction in your toolkit.
fiction, even about hard subjects, is a pleasure to read. Coming into the waiting room, you saw some flashes of portraits related to my new novel, Black Bottom Saints. Creating pleasure to read was one of the guiding principles when I constructed Black Bottom Saints. I knew it was a novel about personal and public trauma, but the theme of the novel was joy is radical. So I wanted to make it a five cents pleasure to read. Actually, each chapter ends with a libation, some of which include alcohol, some of which don't. And those cocktails allow it to be a five cents pleasure to read. But even without that, a great novel addresses all five senses. And one advantage of putting novels in your anti-racist toolkit is even when novels address difficult or repellent subjects, they do it at a distance that make it easier to discuss, even when there is no alcohol in the room. They allow us to be sober and ecstatic. That is why reading a novel together can be an excellent team building exercise if you want to confront, parse bias without putting individuals on blast, but allowing people to get really candid. Rather than discuss a literal shared event, you can more easily and more robustly often parse a shared reading with vigor and a lesser level of shame and pain. This time of racial reckoning is a time of progress, but it is also a time of shame and pain. No one in this room, in this Zoom, is immune to being the brunt of someone else's race-based projections. Since the death of George Floyd on May 25th, many of your patients and many of you have been exhausted by the persistence of racism and by the impact of racism on your own life, on the life of someone they loved, and on your patients' lives. Others have been worried or even shamed by their own privilege, even as they are angry or wounded by patients who project their race-based fears and angers on them. To be a nurse in this moment is to want to do more when you are already doing so much. And that is where the novel approach to building an anti-racist toolkit comes in in a different way. Joy is radical. That's a theme of Black Bottom Saints. Another is love is the strut and hate is the stumble. A third is be good to yourself. And I say this in a non-secular way, amen. If you remember one thing about this talk, let it be this. Joy is radical and you deserve joy. Reading novels, reading fiction can be an important part of your self-care practice. And as you are essential workers, both as healthcare providers and as diversity experts, the future of the country depends on you taking excellent care of yourselves. To get you started with flash fiction, I offer these four titles. Girl by Jamaica Kincaid, Riddle by Agbiwa Amadan, The Appointment in Samara by Somerset Mom, and The Visitor by Lydia Davis. But fiction reading is not just an escape, though it, you deserve escapes. It is also an intake into necessary but seldom asked questions. What does it mean to be sick and human? What does it mean to be sick and black? How does it differ from being sick and Asian, sick and white, sick and a new immigrant, sick and labeled an illegal immigrant, sick and queer? What does it mean to be sick and a hyphenated human? Identity matters to the sick, complicating both being sick and healing, complicating relations between those who are sick and those who would heal them, complicating relations between nurses and nurses, nurses and doctors, nurses and administrators. None of these relationships are immune to systemic racism and other forms of structural bias. But sometimes the antidote to structural 
and systemic bias is a strong dose of individual empathy followed by individual compassion. Nothing catalyzes our ability to provide empathy better than reading fiction. As a novelist, I get to invite people to imagine. I tell you some of the details when I write a novel. You imagine the rest. Reading strengthens the imagination because it requires you to use your imagination. When you watch a movie version of a novel, many more details are provided from hair color to room description to accents. When you read, you imagine and provide the de details. This noon, I want you to imagine that being sick is for many patients, being in the hospital for many patients. Illness itself is a journey into the heart of racism. Whether or not you know this, I want to, you to imagine this and to invite you to imagine. I've written a flash fiction for this occasion. Lorena, she arrives at the medical center parking lot, suspecting she is having a third bout of kidney stones, sure she needs to pick up dog food at the Pet Smart, but fearing she might vomit on the gray linoleum if she stops to pick it up. Her temperature is taken. She answers a few questions. She's on the escalator waiting to see the nurse who stands between her and the doctor, she thinks, rock or door. Lorena's thoughts race, then branch, then stall, returning to the same self-torturing questions. Will they give me less pain medication because I am black? If I get COVID and get truly sick, will it be my fault because I'm overweight? Is it always going to be hard for me to manage small new feelings in my body because of the large feeling I always has there's something wrong with my body because my body is black? Can I count on my nurse just helping me to have respect for my body to want to extend my life? Or will they be like the crazy woman in the grocery store last week who looked at my sweet eight-year-old niece and said, you're the reason I pay so much money in taxes. The waiting room reminds Lorena of an airport waiting room and she wonders if she will ever be on a plane again. It used to be because she thought she might die of breast cancer. She looks at the seat where she prayed, let me get the kind of breast cancer that hits white women more often for which there's more research and more drugs. And she remembers when she got diagnosed with one of the breast cancers that hits black women and hits them hard and she lifted her chin and stopped praying and she promised. I will fight this thing in solidarity with my black sisters and I will fight it angry that we have fewer and less well-funded tools to fight, but I will fight. And when I do, I'll be fighting for the nurse who told me when she left, the, when the doctor left the room. The nurse with pale hair and pale eyes and pale skin, that she too had been like me and chose not to reconstruct her skin was pale, her chin was so up, and her eyes were blue and wide, and my eyes were brown, and my skin is brown, but she was my twin, and she, the nurse, she was saying, you are not your diagnosis. We are a tribe of one-breasted and no-breasted warriors. Lorena's thoughts stopped racing. She made sane like she made her bed every day. End of the flash fiction. Hospitals were historically segregated spaces. Nella Larson trained in segregated spaces, in a segregated nursing school and started her practice in a segregated wards before dealing in a completely different kind of race-based nursing trauma in New York City. Race-based healthcare disparity is a reality that terrifies many Black patients and complicates their engagements with medical centers and with medical providers. Racism contemplates Black people's relationship with their own bodies when they're healthy by suggesting their inherent state is wrong, inferior, or out of whack, and it oftentimes makes their relationship with their unhealthy body unbearable. In this national moment of racial reckoning, all America is facing. I say to the nurses and other healers on this Zoom, you are diversity experts. Your patients include people of different races, creeds, religions, and ethnicities. They vary in gender identity, sexual preference, and preferred pronouns. Every strata of economic status, citizenship status, educational attainment, and intellectual capacity have been your patients. And they include the being born, the just born, and the seconds away from death. 
Whether or not you know it or claim it, every nurse in this Zoom on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis is a witness to getting diversity right and getting diversity wrong. And your patients are trusting you to do what nurses so often do and the nation so often fails to do. This is the thing that nurses so often do. Get diversity right. You engage daily in the most intimate and profound circumstances with diverse individuals. For this reason, many of you are more aware of and more impacted by the pain of the current moment of racial reckoning. You are aware of the frustrations, the confusion, the anger, the exhaustion. Individuals across the spectrums of diversity are feeling around issues of inclusion and exclusion and equity. And thus you are uniquely equipped to ask and answer essential questions. How might race be mattering in the lived experience of this patient? How might race complicate treatment compliance? How might we mitigate the complications that structural racism or other bias creates in this patient's health care or health crisis? You know, you need to know and tell. We need more Nella Larson's nurse novelists. And we need nurses who will not become novelists to tell stories in print in committee meetings, and the best way to prepare to tell a story is to read a story. We need you to tell your patient stories to doctors. They need your diversity education. Tell your stories. Tell them in air and tell them in paper and tell them in electronic media. We need your witness. We need your hard earned expertise on diversity, on multicultural competence. And we need your engagements with fiction, perhaps of Octavia Butler, that will get you to ask questions about whether or not when we engage with discovering and utilizing of cutting edge approaches on data analysis, are we taking into consideration ways in which the race-based digital divide that Vanderbilt Nursing School did not create, but cannot perpetuate? Can, can we close that digital racial divide? Or are we creating without intending create the 21st century digital equivalent of a 20th century segregated hospital ward? when we start data mining, including some and excluding others. There are more and better questions to ask, and when we ask them, many of the good ones will be asked by nurses. And I hope at least a few are posed by nurses who leave this talk and make novel reading a part of their self-care practice and a part of their anti-racism work. Read fiction because it is a great escape, and as a frontline worker, you deserve a great escape. Read fiction because it develops your sense of empathy to read fiction because it brings a joy a jolt. Read fiction because it allows you to gain an intimate look at worlds other than your own. Read fiction because it disengages you from cognitive bias. In close, I want you to introduce you for a moment into the world of my latest novel, Black Bottom Saints. I am a novelist who respects and admires who loves and treasures nurses. I'm a novelist whose recent novel is set in a hospital, Kerwood Hospital in Detroit, and the main character, Ziggy Johnson, so respected the nursing profession, he wrote and published multiple poems about nursing. Ziggy tells this quite simply on the second page of Black Bottom Saints. Comforting me, extending my last trip around the sun, always near, a brown and tender, well-trained hands fluttering or poking of nurses and doctors able and ready to battle death. His community treasured nurses so when he was a patient in Kerwood on his deathbed, he was admonished to look his best and summon his charm as a token of respect for his nurses who were providing him with life-sustaining and spirit-sustaining 
and life extending care. There's another side to the hospital in the black experience and let me let Ziggy tell it. A hospital is the opposite of a cotton field, a boxing ring, a bad bedroom. Those places where black bodies get hurt, worn down, injured. In the hospital, black bodies get tender care, get noticed, get respected, get healed. I feel a special kind of safe at Kerwood. Ziggy's words bear repeating. In the hospital, black bodies get tender care, get noticed, get respected, get healed. One of Ta Ziggy's saints is Tanya Blanding. She's a little black girl who got shot down in her home in the summer of 1967. She weighed 40 pounds. A Michigan State trooper shot her in her own home. She never made it to the hospital. She never made it to Ziggy's dancing school. That's race best structural racism at its worst. It, these are the patients who don't arrive in your hospital. This is Dinah Washington, one of Ziggy's saints, who dies at 37, 38 diet pills. She never met the nurse who put her on the journey I got on. But here's Laverne Baker, second woman to get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame who starts off her career as Little Miss Sharecropper because she sang in overalls and straw hat because she wanted to honor the people left behind in the cotton fields. Laverne will get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and she will perform as a double amputee who fought diabetes for decades because she had the benefit of amazing nurses that she loved and treasured who helped her live her best life and survive to get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I invite you all to be Laverne's nurse. I invite you all to celebrate health centers as special kinds of safe that include respect for race in the healing place, that includes a kind of care Ziggy got. And I hope the care I celebrate through every page of Black Bottom Saints, the extraordinary care that nurses provide. And I thank you for it. And I thank you by writing fiction for you to sustain you and distract you, the true diversity experts. Thank you for inviting me to come today. Thank you so much, Professor Randall. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for your wisdom. I know that I've been getting lots of messages and everyone has thoroughly enjoyed everything that you've shared with us so far. Um, there were a couple of things that I wanted to clarify for everyone and then we do have some questions for you. Um, one, Professor Randall, there were lots of interests in the reading list that you were describing. Um, will we be able to gain access to that list? Absolutely. Um, Julia, Steed, and Dean, they will be sent out as a gift to you from the uh, Vanderbilt Nursing School. Thank you. Um, the second thing is that um, a few people wanted to know more information about how they could share your talk. Um, and so I wanted to let everyone know that we do intend to post this talk to our YouTube, cha um, YouTube channel for VUSN. And so at that point, you are more than, will you, you are more than welcome to share this talk among um, people that you know. Um, and then everyone thoroughly enjoyed your flash fiction. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so Professor Randall, we do have some questions now. Great. Uh, one question is, um, how do we tell our patients stories and stories of our own family members for the purposes of advocacy while also being mindful of their agency in choosing whether their stories get told? These are great questions. So number one, we want to ask the great questions. One, within you, there are settings in which you are allowed, say to a doctor or to a team, to discuss what's going on with your patient. And so there, there's that. How you take it out into the world, that's a longer discussion, but some of the general things have been done is to speak collectively and not to, to collage six, seven patients to change the gender, to speak more abstractly and speak of the 
structure. Also, there are patients, you, um, you also have your colleagues. I spoke to you today. I am a colleague of yours because I'm on Vanderbilt faculty. I have also been a patient. You can speak to your colleagues who are not your patients and ask them and say, I've had an experience. Have you had anything like this that I would be free to share? For example, I've, and you will find that that, you have, that that might be very empowering and for your colleagues to share one of their stories that, they can, that you can then put forward and say, so it's about abstraction and you'll need specific guidelines on what is ethical in this direction and there are all kinds of questions about that. But these are great questions and Vanderbilt Nursing School is a place to ask that. What are the ethics of this storytelling? Because the stories must be told. Thank you. Our next question is, um, someone wrote, since you are a fabulous cookbook editor, I will relate food to fiction. She says that I like, Im I like embedding into a culture by sharing a meal. I get out of my comfort zone and it is an intimate thing to eat someone else's food. Professor Randall, do you share any uh, similar experiences? Absolutely. A biscuit can be a short story. Um, there can be a narrative in a drink. And one of the ways to taste another culture, it is that, that was a brilliantly insightful person, that person is to eat their food, smell their smells. It's the thing that makes you more comfortable in difference. Eating the food of a, of, from a different place and a different time helps us get comfortable with difference, helps us have that experience of surprise and intrigue. Thank you so much. Helps us be courageous. Absolutely. Our next question is, um, do you have any advice for new writers? Yes, that it's simpler than you think. Everyone in on this call can be an important writer. Have something important to say, say it in your own voice, and then you can get a little craft. Anybody can teach you some craft. It's not something that somebody, some people are born with and some people aren't. Everyone has something significant to say, and everyone has their own voice. Your writing voice will be different than your spoken word voice. That sometimes people have a trouble figuring that out, but you can coach that quickly. And um, I volunteer next year. I will, Dean Norman and uh, Dr. Johnson, you can put me on that. I will do a one time free writing workshop for nurses who want to engage in fiction because this is not some mysterious thing that you can't do. Yes, you can that the craft is the least of it. You already have the stories and what I have to do is help you find your voice. So just number one is no, you can't. Excellent. And one of the things of flash fictions, if I were offering some fiction to um, a patient, one thing you might offer are multiple things and just say, these are things I love. Because then you're not telling them about your story. You're saying, this is something I love. Thank you so much for that offer. And we will definitely take you up on that. <laughs> um, you were asked to elaborate on your statement that nonfiction does not help to develop empathy. The question is, how is that learning the real history of others? How is learning the real history of others help you develop empathy? This is a nuanced point. I read a lot of nonfiction and nonfiction is extremely important. Facts are important. But we have a lot of evolving science. But if you just think about it, when you're reading, you can read facts about the Civil War. I can tell you that 90% of, um, I can tell you that, the, I can tell you a percentage of Black women who were raped in, in, in slavery, in the slavery period. That doesn't make you care about it. Those, I can list the number of people that were raped in Nashville last year. That doesn't make you care about it. When you read the book of night women, you may care about it differently and understand it differently. So facts alone, often when you are confronted with facts, they can become overwhelming and you say that was the past, how does it matter? And you don't recognize how it was haunting some of your patients or clients or people in America to this day. 
Many people read the fat facts about Tanya Blanding, the 40 pounds of her and the 40 bullets, and fail to care about it. Um, George Floyd, what, what happened on May 25th, 2020, why did that capture our attention in a new way? He called out for his mama. That's my explanation. He told a one word story, mama, a grown man, and the world listened. If you just had heard the facts that a black man may be passing counterfeit bills, was apprehended by the police, and they, in the process of apprehending him, somehow he died because he had some pre-existing medical conditions, which are the facts of that story. There are not 2,000 people in this communities across the world that are in protest. He told his story with one word, mama that told us he was human, that told us he was vulnerable, it told us he wanted help, it told us he wants new love and trust, it told us even if he passed a counterfeit bill, he didn't deserve to die. It told us that the person who could hear him call mama and not take a knee off his neck was functioning in a less than human way. All in a one word story he told on his deathbed, mama. The nonfiction version of that, I can't breathe, that is him telling the fact. No one cared about the fact he couldn't breathe. They cared about mama. And the person who doesn't care about the fiction, because animals don't create fiction. Animals don't read fiction. When you don't care about the stories people are telling you about themselves, you are acting in ways that are less than human. So it's a good test. All kinds of good people cannot care about facts. There are a lot of, I didn't care for a long time about the fact about how you know, obesity might lead to higher incidences of my having breast cancer. All of these things, there are lots of facts we can arrange to not care about. But fiction, it's harder to be a good person and not care about. Professor Randall, this will be our last question. We're coming to the end of our time together. Um, what made you write Black Bottom Saints, if you could answer that <laughs> in a brief manner? The simplest answer was, I knew that in my actual life, I, had, I was an abused child. My mother was an abusive mother. And I knew I had a very different, so abusive, I was put in the hospital once. And it was nurses that empowered me there, actually. That's another story. Um, I knew I had a very different outcome than most people who had those early childhood experiences. And I wanted to look at how my community, how a little inner city dancing school and interventions of the right people at the right moment and amazing father had helped me get from trauma to transcendence and to a very happy life and to share that wisdom with a larger world that was often thinking you can't get from trauma to transcendence, that certain early childhoods make it impossible to have a happy adulthood. And actually, I've never told this story before, but I will tell this story right now in close. When I was hospitalized and I was about to have a spinal, uh, some kind of spinal tap the next day, because I wasn't speaking and no one knew what was happening, there were two nurses and a nurse, they weren't even my nurse, who seeing this family move around, and my family was very privileged, they began to guess that maybe I really could talk. And one of them actually said to me, you need to say something and get out of here or you're going to have a dangerous something happen to you. And you need, to, they literally, the one lady said, I don't think this family of yours cares about you and they're going to let this happen. But I think you can. And that nurse, who wasn't even my nurse, Sid inspired me to get up and walk out of that hospital and decide to get a better life. So this book is about the collective wisdom. Ziggy loved nurses. I did know the real Ziggy Johnson. It's 61 stories of people who know a lot about moving from trauma to transcendence. And it's telling the story in ways that which will be useful to other people. And there's short reads, some as short as three pages to six pages. So you can dive right in. You don't have to stop, start at page one and go to the end. You can dive in wherever you see fit and spend five minutes with it and get something, 
or you can read the entire long novel and see how it interweaves into a complex story that's been compared to the Canterbury Tales. But you will know that joy is radical, that though Ziggy is dying, he is helped by nurses and doctors to have four great months that we don't always one doctor says beat draft like a drum, but ultimately it's the witness. And that's what nurses are there. It's not, we don't always get to win, but we always get to be the best self we can be in that moment of challenge. And we find then joy is radical. Thank you so much for letting me be with you today and share those stories. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. And I would just like to encourage everyone that has attended our lecture today to be sure to purchase her new book, Black Bottom Saints. Um, you can purchase a hard copy. And I just found that I found that it's an audible as well. So you can purchase an audio stream as well. Or just follow us on Black Bottom Saints and Instagram and get lots of free material. Although I love it if you support it, but get lots of free material. And we've got lesson plans. And at www.alicerandall.com and www.blackbottomsaints.com, we um, have lots of other really free, cool things and art for it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, I will be in contact soon with everyone registered with um, the reading list and more resources for you. And Dr. Rolanda Johnson, if you would like to give some final remarks. I know the time is short. And um, I'd like to say a couple of things. First of all, thank you, Professor Randall, for such a phenomenal talk. You have reminded each of us that nursing is truly a art and a science and the importance of having collaborations across many disciplines. But if I had to stick in a pen in a couple of things, I would say, you reminded us that nurses have to get diversity right. And the other thing is the power of one word, one word. For George Floyd, that was mama. Or for others, it may be another word that bridges all of mankind together as you eloquently challenged us as nurses to help fight this battle against racism be it individual or systemic. And um, we look forward to partnering with you as we begin to explore fiction more in our individual lives and as a discipline so that we can better understand those things that are uncomprehensible. Thank you so much. Thank you all for saving so many lives. That's the simplest side. It is an art and thank you for saving lives. Thank you for being experts. Alice, you're always inspiring. Thank you for giving me just, this. Just amazing. So we just so appreciate you sharing your time with us. We certainly will take you up on your offer uh, of, of a writing workshop and um, you'll be hearing more from us of opportunities to collaborate. Yay. <laughs> thank you. And I think that will conclude this lecture. I want to thank all of the registered attendees for joining us. Um, thank you for sharing. Thank you for asking questions. And we will be sharing resources shortly. We hope that you will attend our next lecture um, and we will be publishing that sometime later in the fall. Thank you. <laughs>